What's happening, everybody, and welcome back to the Funky Brain Podcast. My name is Dennis, and this is my funky brain up here, right up here. There used to be hair there, but now it's just my funky brain. You can see right through it. But our guest today, he's a film producer, a writer, a stand-up comedian. He helped produce such notable films as Ray, Afternoon Delight, wrote the pilot episode of the TV series Halfway There that premiered at the Sundance Film Festival. Also a fellow podcaster and host of the Drunkalogs, which fits in nicely with us here at the Funky Brain Podcast, Mr. Nick Morton. How are you doing today, sir? I'm great. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Dennis. You know, I love the idea of Drunkalogs. I think it's uh, for those that have sat in the rooms of AA or 12-step rooms of recovery over the years, we always, people are always talking about their Drunkalogs and their horror stories while they're drunk. Share with our listeners a little about your story and, you know, what it was like, what happened, what it's like now, how it led to who you are and drunk lives and all that stuff. The reason I started doing that was because the, um, you know, the, the stories that you hear in the rooms are always so interesting and funny and moving and the moments of complete and um, total uh, demoralization that people discover in their journeys where they also often find their strength in these moments of like insane darkness where suddenly they're given a glimpse of clarity and a, a, a way to, you know, move forward in their lives with sort of hope and meaning are just, just shocking. Like to me, that's, that's the grace of God right there. Like when in your darkest moment, you're shown a, a way to, to persevere. So I, I started the podcast really because people would tell these stories. I'd hear these stories in these rooms and you would never get a chance to sort of follow up to ask someone like, Oh, you know, you were, you were uh, passed down in a, you know, a, a crack house in St. Louis and now you've got a hundred people reporting to you. And like, how did you go from that to this? And what really is this? You know, when you, when you say you have a big job and a beautiful life, like what are the specifics of that life? And to give, give me the opportunity to, um, you know, delve a little deeper with people and find out, you know, some of the, some of the things that, you know, maybe they don't think are important, but that, as they tell their stories, sort of, you know, elicit curiosity in the listener. The other side of it is just the context of a life in recovery. You know, what does recovery mean in the context of a life that you were trying to do whatever, whether you were me, me trying to, you know, become a film producer or someone who was trying to, I have one great interview with this guy, Jimmy Shin, who's a hilarious stand-up comedian. And he tells the story of like how he devoted so much of his life to becoming a lawyer because it's what his parents wanted from him. And it was only once um, he got sober that he was just able to accept that like lawyering was not going to be a life he could ever lead. And that this thing that he was getting curious about and interested in, which was stand up comedy was really something that could sustain his engagement over a life. Whereas like being a lawyer was just never going to satisfy that like, fundamental thing in his in his soul so yeah so and and I I mean he tells this story about I can't quite remember what it was but he had like his dad like custom made a a poster that was like Jimmy Shin attorney at law and he had it hanging over his bed yeah. from the time he was like in second grade and you know he ends up successfully graduating from law school and like he starts a practice and like whatever his life blows up in, in ways that you know you can listen to on the podcast but like ultimately he has no choice but to move back in to the house that his parents are living in and there it still is hanging above his wall this like poster just haunting him jimmy shin attorney at law and you know, that's a lot to put on a kid to like then have to force him to you know, ultimately find a path of their own. And, you know, I mean, I think that, you know, I think I, I relate to that so much because it's part of my story. And I think it's, it's part of a lot of stories. I mean, I, you know, I grew up in this very sort of affluent sort of cocktail culture in um, North Shore of Long Island, where most of the dads were bankers who were commuting into New York City and coming back on the weekends. And life sort of revolved around the weekend, like that was what everyone celebrated. And it was, you know, a time of getting drunk and playing sports and, you know, and it was, it was, it was sort of an ideal, idyllic, if, um, you know, sort of limited um, perspective kind of uh, childhood. And then I, I ended up going to boarding school 
because that's just sort of what happened in, in the, the town I grew up in. Pretty much everyone at my school went to boarding school. The school went through ninth grade and then you went off to boarding school. Second, I got to boarding school. I mean, I just knew it was on. Like I, like I, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd had my, I'd had my, like, I had my first drink when I was maybe four, right. You know, um, wine at my grandmother's house. And you know, I remember getting a little tipsy and like my family thinking it was funny and like just loving that everyone thought I was funny. Like that was always something that just really like, you know, gave me that serotonin shot that I crave, you know, making a, a room full of people. I remember like making some crack watching a movie and like my dad just delighting in the fact that the entire theater was laughing at, um, you know, the fact that I, that I had said something funny, I don't remember what it was, but you know, then I get to be sort of in sixth grade and we would sort of sneak out of our parents' house. And I remember like stealing a, a handle of, of rum and going out on the golf course and just like getting, I was blackout drunk, but I was completely shit faced. Loving it. I mean, loving the adventure of it, being with my friends and doing something that was kind of grown up and illicit, but that was like, made us feel great too. You know, and I kind of continued in that pattern for a while until I got to boarding school. And then, you know, there were there were kids at my boarding school who were obvious stoners. You know, they were wearing like Guyabara shirts and like, you know, big crazy hair and like, um, and I just like, I wanted to be a part of that. And so, you know, the first instant, the first chance I got to start smoking pot, I was completely in and, you know, became, quickly became like the biggest stoner at that school and, you know, started doing LSD. And, you know, that lasted, I would say for probably like some point in my junior year or maybe my senior year, I can't remember, I discovered booze. Like, I mean, I was always drinking, but like drinking really became the thing that I liked the most. And that like, I sort of stopped smoking. I was, I was like no longer like a major stoner. I mean, I had a reputation for being a stoner, but like, I really like wasn't smoking that much pot anymore. I was really just into just like slamming huge amounts of vodka until eventually I perforated my stomach lining and was throwing up blood. And I was drinking, you know, like a liter of vodka a day when I was 18 years old. But like, even at the time, it didn't feel to me like escapism or like a, a, an addiction. It felt like I'm still on this adventure. Like I was, in my mind, I was like Jack Kerouac. I was this beat poet who was, you know, um, on the trail of, you know, some mystic revelation. And I mean, I wasn't writing any poetry, <laughs> but like it felt, it felt like a religious journey. I got thrown out of boarding. So, you know, I've, I had to go to the, I was scared because of all this blood. And so I had to go to the infirmary and I had to, I, I was worried about my health and I had to explain like what I was doing to myself. And they were just like, oh my God, well, what have we gotten into? And so they sent me home and there was a sort of a rigmarole with, um, you know, whether or not the school was ever going to let me back in. And I had a girlfriend at the time who I was you know, madly in love with. And I was, I was going to do anything to get back. And I eventually met with this woman who was sort of like the foremost expert on teenage alcoholism in the sort of tri-state area in New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. And she was like, look, you're an alcoholic, but I don't think that should interfere with your education. And so she gave, she signed, sort of signed off on my bill of health to send me back to school. And I promised I wouldn't drink and I got back to school and I, I really, I didn't drink for the rest of the time I was there, but I did like smoke, smoke more pot again. And I graduated. And, you know, the thing is at that point, like after that, like drinking was really never the same for me because it had threatened so seriously to disrupt my life. It had, I had had to go to the hospital. I had just, I had, you know, they, there's that expression that, um, alcohol starts as fun and then it's fun with trouble and then it's just trouble. And I'd had this sort of huge dose of trouble when I was 18. And um, so from that point forward, every time I drank, there was always this like voice in my head that was like, you know, don't drink too much, pace yourself, Nick, you know, like, um, you know, I got still gotten tons of trouble from that point forward. And the next 18 years are, are kind of a blur. I mean, I, I came to Hollywood, you know, kind of on a lark because I didn't want to become an investment banker. And, you know, I got a job working at uh, one of the agencies. I worked at William Morris. And then from there, I got a job working at um, Phoenix Pictures, which was an independent financing studio. I had similar jobs like that. I worked for Philip Anschutz, who owns the um, LA Kings and Howard Baldwin. They had a team together. They had a, <laughs> they had a team. They're both, they're both NHL owners. So I, uh, I had a, we had, they had a company together. Um, which is where we made Ray um, and a bunch of other films. And, you know, on some level, I wasn't, I wasn't fully engaged in it. You know, I would get home from work every night and just, you know, usually plow through a couple of vodkas and maybe some wine and, you know, just sort of medicating the, you know, malaise I was just sort of 
feeling. I had children. I got married. I had kids. I have a 13-year-old and 11-year-old right now. And um, there were times during their young childhood where I stopped. When they were babies, I realized, like, holy shit, I can't, like, actually, like, wake up in the middle of the night, feed a child, go back to sleep, and, and be drunk while I'm doing it. Not because I was... Not because I was, my motor skills were too impaired, but because the hangover was just killing me. And, um, you know, I was getting more and more sort of just like demoralized by the fact that like, I didn't enjoy drinking, like it wasn't doing the trick I needed it to do, but I didn't have any other tools for getting myself excited about life, for wanting to be around people, being happy really. And um, I remember having this party here for our old friends who we hadn't seen since we were having kids and just like getting so like having a drink, it having no effect on me, having another drink, it had no effect on me. And then like the next thing I kind of remember, I'm like waking up on the bathroom floor, you know, around this time I got, I got into a fender bender and there were some issues with our insurance and it had me very anxious about what was ultimately going to happen with this fender bender. I was up all night worrying about it and just worrying about the chaos in my life. I realized like something, something had to give. And I had one sober friend at that time. I remember my, my last drink was a, uh, was, a, was a bottle of Heineken, which really was not one of my favorite things to drink. I wish I could have gone out with like a, you know, an icy cold glass of Kettle One vodka or, you know, a perfectly composed martini, but it was just like a Heineken, one Heineken that night. And uh, to help me sleep, and, you know, I woke up in the morning and called my friend and he was like, you know, you just have to like stop drinking and start counting your days and I, I'll take you to a meeting. And he took me to a meeting and, you know, I got to that meeting and like I'm sitting in that room and like there's like a sort of 55 year old housewife sort of sharing of her disease and how she would hide bottles around her house. And like a lot of things that I just I, I wasn't doing, but I saw myself in her. And then there was a guy who was very much like me, you know, sort of. 40 something young, youngish parent with young kids who was, you know, sort of trying to balance the responsibilities of parenthood with, you know, drinking and how hard he, was, he had found that. And, and I was like, oh my God, that's, that's me. And then there was like a, a homeless Hispanic kid who was talked about, you know, waking up on a park bench that morning. And I was like, oh my God, that is me. You know, it's just kind of revelatory that I had been there were these people that had struggled with the same issues that I had struggled with that seemed to be finding some peace and some purpose and some humor and some joy in a world that had lost all those things for me. And, um, you know, I, st I stopped, I stopped drinking then. And I, I really never, never looked back. Um, because drinking, I had I, like, people are like, how could you stop drinking? I was like, I really had pretty much explored everything there was to explore in drinking, there was just like nothing, there was nothing unknown about it to me. And like, it had proven itself again and again to be a, um, a path of diminishing returns. I just wasn't getting the same sense of adventure and fun and curiosity out of it that I had gotten when I was younger. You know, I remember saying to my friends who took me to the first meeting that like, um, I just want to be more honest in my life. And like, it wasn't that I was lying to the people around me that much. I mean, every now and then I'd have to tell some lie about how much I drank that much. But like, I felt like all the alcohol I was consuming was acting as an impediment to know myself and what I might be capable of and what I might really want out of life. You know, and I'm still like, now that I'm sober, I'm still very much engaged in that journey. Like, I don't know, like, I really don't know what what I want or what I expect. But like the interesting thing is that getting sober sort of gave me the freedom to try new things and to pursue my curiosity and not be impeded by my fear. It made my life much more interesting. I mean, much bigger. And I mean, I, those are sort of cliches, but like, you know, once I got sober, I, um, you know, I started doing stand up comedy and like, that was just like a rush and an experience that I, you know, I just thought I would never have again in my life. Like, you know, falling in love as a teenager or, um, you know, taking cocaine for the first time. I mean, you're like to put yourself up on a stage in front of a bunch of strangers to try to make them laugh and then actually succeeding at it was just the most, I mean, the most insane fun I, I could I still think it's like the, about the most fun thing you can do. With that experience, while that ultimately hasn't necessarily led to anything, it did lead, lead to me starting a podcast, which I've 
has been wildly satisfying just in the amount of the number of people that I've met and been able to form friendships with and collaborate with outside of the podcast. And then it also helped me recognize that like my creative voice was valuable. And so that gave me a lot more confidence in my writing that like I could actually see things through to their conclusion. And you know, whether they succeed or, or they don't succeed, I felt like my experience in life and my perspective on my experience in life has value, whether it's comedic value or emotional value or enter entertainment value of some sort. And um, you know, I don't think I would have discovered that had I not gotten sober. Yeah, awesome stuff, man. It's a great story. Like we all have a different version of the same story. And that that's what's cool. Like when you say you walk in and there's like this person talking about this, this person talking about this, and we have nothing in common and we would never otherwise talk, but we were very similar. It's amazing stuff. But one of the things that I love that, that you said that was this freedom. I have choices now. Like I like to stay pretty fit and healthy. And we have in Colorado, we have uh, these 14,000 foot mountains. There's like 50 something of them. People are like, Hey, you want to go hike a 14 er And I can't, you know, I'm like, I didn't crash my car into shit that doesn't move last night. Right. Um, I remember where I woke up. I remember where I was last night too. And sure. I'm fed enough. I'm not on any meds and, uh, I can go for a hike tomorrow. Yeah, sure. Let's go do that. Like, that's pretty cool. I think it's also <laughs> like, you know, when I talked about the sort of the honesty element of it, I feel like when you're struggling to maintain an addiction, because it is a struggle to maintain it, to like pay for it, keep it from disrupting your life, but still taking care of it. It's an enormous amount of psychic energy that you devote to that, that actually steals some of the energy that you might devote to other things. It makes you less present in the other things that you're trying to do. And the, at least for me, I always I had this sort of this shame and this guilt about my behavior that, um, you know, sort of reinforced this idea that I didn't deserve success or, um, or that um, my experience was um, somehow less valuable because I knew about this like damage that I was, you know, sort of semi secretly um, inflicting on myself in my other life as an addict. Yeah, the energy that you put into it, and you know, in recovery we talk about it a lot. But it's like if I just put half of the energy I put into that as into into my recovery, then I'll be wildly successful. All the the money, the energy, the um, that we put into finding an eight ball on, right. on Monday morning when I was supposed to be going to work and trying to find enough money to put that together and drive to some place where people might shoot me to buy <laughs> drugs. If I just put a little bit of that energy into living a healthy, happy, responsible life, I'm going to be really happy and successful. And it's amazing how our minds work. It keeps bringing us back there, even though it's killing us. And it's a sad story too. You know, one of these stories I tell years ago when I first got sober, I, I went to this club and there was this guy he was actually a street guy. So he held up the signs. He had the overcoat, the long beard, and all that, like the stereotypical drunk under the bridge. He fell asleep under the bridge one night in a snowstorm, and they had to cut his legs off. So he was in a rehab facility and not a substance abuse for, you know, physical rehab So to get through that. And during that time, he, he was in that rehab facility for six months to learn how to not have legs anymore. I was even his sponsor for a little while. And we talked and he would go to meetings every day. And like, I was like his lifeline for a little while. And six months was up. He got out of that rehab facility and he started drinking. They cut his legs off. Like, <laughs> so you're like, what is it going to take for us to see that this is killing us? Like we have, like, we have hard head. I'm a hard headed dude right here. In the book, it talks about um, what the program has to have depth and weight. Because I need whatever is going to get through my skull to be deep and heavy. Otherwise, I just don't get it. Yeah, and it's, it's sort of a mystery as to why some people are able to get it and others aren't, you know, that like how it is. You know, sometimes I'm like, oh, you know, if, if you look at the sort of disease um, model for what addiction means, then I'm like, oh, I just like, I didn't have that bad a dose. It's like, it's like I, got, I got infected with a small amount of the virus as opposed to like, a huge amount of the virus that's going to kill you. And then I was talking to a friend of mine who's, who's not an addict, but just sort of about the, the notion of like love and that like 
however else I, I had enough love as a child that there was some there was some light that I was trying to get back to the whole time that like that like I remembered what it felt like to not um, despise myself so much that I just wanted to turn off everything in my head that reminded me of who I was that like at some fundamental level I had I had a, a degree of a sense of self and a sense of self-esteem that I that I wanted to work back to being in touch with you know mm -hmm. and I lose that all the time every, every day I lose that you know every day I struggle to remind myself that like that I'm valuable and um and that I'm you know that I'm worthy of being loved and that I'm that I don't deserve to be destroyed interesting you know I think that there's a topic that I know you're familiar with and a lot of people are too but it's emotional sobriety, emotional well-being. A lot of people are under the impression that I'm going to stop drinking and make a million dollars and lose 30 pounds and get the perfect relationship and everything's going to be perfect and rainbows and unicorns. And it, it doesn't work that way. It's rare. It can happen that way every once in a while. It's extraordinarily rare. In fact, I haven't met anybody that that's how it worked. That's the way that it worked. And you know, it requires every day, like you're looking at a couple, you and I, a couple successful guys that are sitting here with clear eyes and a pretty decent attitude. And so if people watching this, they're like, oh, well, you were born lucky. You know, you didn't have to deal with what I had to deal with. But I did. I mean, I almost died thousands of times. I was in over 20 drunken car accidents. I had, if I showed you pictures of me before I got sober 17 years ago, you wouldn't recognize me. I was 70 pounds heavier than I am now. I had purple, dark, black circles under my eyes. But I worked hard to get to where I am now. I think the thing that people don't understand and that I didn't understand when I was still drinking and using is that the, the booze is the cure. You know, when, you, when you're a heroin addict, you need your fix because that's what fixes you. You know, for me, booze was my fix. I mean, it, it fixed me. It fixed everything that was wrong with me. It made it all go away. And then I, then I could be present. I, I stopped worrying about what was going to happen to me because I deserved to die. I deserved to be hated. I deserved to be mocked and ridiculed. Like the, the booze turned all that off and, and actually enabled me to, to be present in my life in ways that I really struggled without it. And then, you know, you take that away from you know the addict and suddenly like the one tool they have to to address all of their you know all of their flaws is no longer available to them and now they're stuck sitting in it and living with it and you know the thing that um, recovery helps is to give you a you know a sort of a set of tools that enables you to um, walk through the world without needing that other cure because you have the cure of, um, you know, service to other people and meditation and connection, a spiritual connection to, you know, a higher power. And, um, um, and also you're not hopelessly damaged every day by the, um, you know, the, the chemicals that you've ingested the night before. So, um, you know, it's, it's a, it's sort of a one, two punch. It's like, it's it's not only sort of just like taking away the, the drugs that that were you know from the world's perception doing so much damage to you because in your mind they're the thing that's actually keeping you alive but then also replacing them with something that you know fills the void that they were filling yeah and it's just a matter of tapping into that stuff you know i was doing a meditation the other day and i went really deep and you know some days you get there and some days you don't but I got really deep and it was like, you know, I realized, you know, I'm going through a really tough time, the hardest of my life. You know, I don't remember getting sober because it's been a long time, but I'm going through a separation of an eight year relationship and it's been really painful. I'm only like four months in, but right. I'm already like, I'm through the bleeding heartache. It's just like some sadness that I get now. So I went deep and I was like, you know, I am worthy of all the love and the success in the world. And I wrote that down. Like the thing is like, we want to sit in our sadness when we get it. We want the anger, the resentment, the fears. We want to sit in that and feel it and then move beyond it. We don't want to sit in it for like three weeks or three months or three years or more. We want to sit in it, feel it. What is the lesson I'm supposed to learn and then move beyond it. But then here's where I went next. Cause it's like, I do deserve all the love and the success in the world. But here's the thing. I already have 
all the love and success in the world. And it's inside of me and it's inside of you and every one of us, but we need to tap into it every single day. Otherwise I drift back into worry, remorse, fear, anger, resentment, and pity and why me, like all this stuff. And I'm like, why do I even, why does my brain even go there? But it has been going there since I was five years old. You said that when you right. were drink it, I was four years old. I had all those things inside me at five. So when I was 15 and took a drink and I was like, wow. like that was awesome. I didn't have to feel that shit anymore. And that's such a common story. And it's, a, it's so easy to get stuck in it. And, but I think that's why, that's why meetings work. They're a great place to go especially in the beginning, because you're surrounding yourself with other people that understand what you're talking about. The meetings also give you a sense of community and a sense of belonging and a sense of shared purpose, which, you know, I think modern society, all those things are hard to find. I've found them incredibly hard to find in this pandemic, the sense of, you know, sort of helplessness and this desire to help. And yet this fear that, um, you know, you're going to get sick and you have a family to take care of. And it's like, well, I really can't afford to get sick. So how, you know, how can I be of service? And um, I think that one of the things that you really get in recovery is this, this opportunity to be of service just by sharing your story, um, you know, showing up. It's, it's a tiny little thing that you can do. And that actually, I mean, I go to meetings sometimes feeling so terrible and so pointless. And I'll just, start talking and you know afterwards someone says god that thing that you said i really relate to that it makes a lot of sense to me and i you know I'm so thankful that like i feel so good that i was able to help someone even just not not even try i wasn't even trying to like you know be some model citizen but just like someone recognizing a little bit of themselves and you makes them less lonely you know yeah good stuff man. so wrapping it up a little bit if you can go back here's kind of a serious question but fun at the same time if you can go back to your 15 year old self and have a talk with that guy, what would you tell that kid? I think I'd tell him he was okay. <laughs> you know, that like, he's good, man. And he's, he's talented and, um, and he shouldn't be afraid to fail and he shouldn't be afraid to be mocked or laughed at. And that, that he shouldn't be afraid to lead either that, you know, he can be his authentic self and take risks and everyone's going to love him just as much um maybe more once they uh actually know who he is well I, what i got out of that was be yourself that's my favorite piece of that puzzle it takes us a long time to be comfortable with that you know some people never even get there no i mean i i struggle every day to just like try to you know try to be myself you know you know what helps with that because i did a lot of motivational speaking before now nobody's going anywhere so before all the uh pandemic so standing up in front of a bunch of people, that'll help you with, with that, some of that stuff. <laughs> Definitely for me, the, I, I mean, I still like stand up is such a funny thing because like, I, you know, I believe the jokes I tell at stand up, you know, someone else telling that joke, it's, it's probably not funny, but you know, I mean, I remember when the first time, right before I went on stage, my, um, for, the, for the first time in front of a real audience, my, my comedy teacher, this guy, Jerry Katzman, you know, you spend all this time writing these jokes and working out these punchlines and these act downs and these twists and stuff. And it's all, it's pretty mechanical. And, you know, then you memorize it and you've got the mechanics of this worked out and you've got a script and you're going to go on stage and you're going to say this script and make it seem like it's, you know, like it's just you being funny, right? And he's like, and that's your material right? That's what you call your material. Oh, here's my material. I've worked out this new material. And he's like, remember, your material is not funny. You are funny. Mm -hmm. And I, he said, that's all of us, you know, to our, to our group right before we went on stage. And I was, it was so freeing because it's like, really, if you're just yourself, they're going to laugh. It's the yeah. minute you're trying to be something else or be the expectation of what you and your mind think is funny. Like that's never going to make them laugh. It's, it's an authentic, it's an authentic experience with you that actually the audience is looking for. That is an awesome, powerful message. I hope people latched onto that and really heard that. That's really great. Thank you so much, Nick. So if people want to get in touch with you, how would they do that? Uh, you can email me at thedrunkalogs at gmail.com, Twitter at Mortonopolis, and Instagram at Mortonopolis. Awesome, man. Well, we're certainly going to do that, and I appreciate your time. And thanks, everybody, for tuning in to the Funky Brain Podcast. Have a great day today, unless you have other plans. And I'll talk to you soon. Bye for now.
So you can't think your way into a new way of acting. You have to act your way into a new way of thinking and being. Hi, I'm Dennis Berry, best-selling author, speaker, and life coach for addiction recovery. So many people are stuck in their addiction, whether it's like drugs or alcohol or food or shopping or sex or money, and they think they can just stop or try to figure it out on their own, but they don't change anything in their lives. Nothing changes if nothing changes. In order for change to happen, you have to change something. My clients will be like, oh, I'll stop tomorrow, or if this happens, then I stop, or someday I'll just give it up. And then they just sit around and think, 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 and hope for different or better results, but it doesn't happen. You have to take action. Action most people aren't willing to take. People don't become willing until they're in enough pain, me included. And unfortunately, they wait, and they wait and time passes by. Even if you are willing, you don't even know where to begin. And that's where I come in. In my best-selling book, Funky Wisdom, A Practical Guide to Life, I talk about the how approach. How do I get sober? How do I stop doing drugs? How do I become healthier? How do I have more successful relationships? How do I become more financially successful? And the answer is how. Honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness. I have to honestly admit that there's a problem. I have to honestly admit that things aren't going well and there needs to be changes. And then once I do that, the door opens and I become open to seeing new ways of living. And then I become willing to make those changes. You can't solve a problem with the same mind that created it. That's why I'm here to help. And you know, I've been working with clients for over 15 years and helping them get clean and sober and change their lives and achieve inner peace and success. If you or somebody you love is struggling and doesn't know where to begin and how to make those changes to get to where they need to be, give me a call. Not tomorrow or in a week from now when you are hungover and your life is falling apart. Call now. Start making that change today and you'll be glad that you did. I'm sending you love and good vibes. Have a great day today.